Hi, I'm Carlene, and this is Carlene Tonight. Hi, I'm Carlene, and this is Carlene Tonight. We have with us Mr. Pat Mastriani, <laughs> aka Joey Jeremiah. We have my co host, Matt. How are How you guys? Are you doing? We're doing good. I'm, I'm, you know, just like you guys, probably, you know, the minimal um, inner circle, my wife and I, um, we're going to be not going over to our big, you know, family fest this year, um, trying to respect the wishes of everybody to, to, to be safe. And so I think uh, this is just a write off of a year, not just for me, but for obviously millions of people around the world. But um, the good thing about being home all the time is I, I try to be creative. So I wrote my autobiography this year. I, I worked on a documentary for uh, the, the Palooza reunion that we had last year. Um, got that all out to, in, into the marketplace. So I was able to create some original content, um, which is nice considering my industry completely shut down for the good, better part of 2020. And even now, as the industry is reopening, um, you know, my friends who are, are work behind the scenes, they're just, it's not a health, good, safe environment, unfortunately, for them. They're, they're being very, very careful, but incidences are, are popping up. So um, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Now that the vaccine is here, hopefully, God willing, things can slowly start to get back to normal. And it's interesting because Tom Cruise, there was recently a video that, that went viral where he was like, like using colorful language, but he was admonishing his crew saying, listen, they can't shut us down. This can't happen, which means you guys have to be obeying the protocol. And it's just, it's so frustrating. I mean, I come from a, from a, um, a music industry background and the, the entire live music industry is just the, I mean, I know guys that are crippled. Um, I'm friends with Lady Gaga's guitarist and he's like, <laughs> their entire tour was just grounded. Like it's now what? Right. So. And that just did all these all these independent um, entertainment venues. That that's what worries me. I mean, not only the small business people and everything with the shops and whatnot that, that are unfortunately affected, but even the small in, um, industrial uh, not industrial but independently owned yeah. um, music venues, entertainment venues. I have friends who are comedians and musicians as well. Yeah. Um, that's where they make their bread and butter. I mean, I have my friends who, who run giant comic conventions um, or pop culture shows. Um, you know, they have 30, 40, 50,000 people in a weekend that join that gather together to celebrate pop culture. And I don't see that happening or coming back anytime soon. So really what we're doing now is, is really the only way to interact with people properly. And, uh, we'll just have to, um, hang in there and, and, uh, get through it together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for those of you listening, I know Pat um, from the talent agency I used to work at. <laughs> so when he walked through the doors, I was like, oh, my God, Joey Jeremiah. <laughs> That's not true. She would say, uh, Mr. Master Annie, please hold. Have a seat. And when they're ready to talk to you, I will, you know, let you through and up the elevator. You can go. So oh. nine times out of 10, she would make me sit and wait for like an hour just to see my an agent. An hour? An at hour? Least, at least. And then she'd be like, hey, wow. so uh, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Joey, uh, Joey, oh my goodness. Okay, Pat, here's a, here's a question for you. I remember Christian Bale, after doing the Dark Knight series, came out and said, listen, I never want to be called Bruce Wayne or Batman ever again. Does it ever get tiring, man? Not being called Batman, but being called Joey. <laughs> no, dude, you know, like for the last, uh, since, since 05, since 2005, when I left the, the Next Generation series, I had a decade where I just went off and did my own thing. And I didn't even mention the word Degrassi or reach out to any of my co-stars and whatnot for almost 10 years. And then what happened was uh, I got introduced to the convention world and I started meeting hundreds of fans uh, across Canada that were just blown away that the show meant so much to them and um, you know, kept asking me what was the other gang doing what were they up to and I honestly couldn't answer them because I hadn't kept in touch with anybody I wasn't on social media um, and so I slowly started to reach out to people inviting them to join the tour that I was doing across the country to say thank you to everybody and you know now it's a bit of an obsession because nostalgia is huge right now I'm in the business of nostalgia um, you know I, I like I like I, I celebrate the show I celebrate my cast members I celebrate the, some of the creators and um, people who work behind the scenes uh, 
I love it because it's allowed me not only to step backwards in time, but to reacquaint myself with people that were very dear to me growing up in those early teenage years that are kind of, you know, they, they mold your personality and they shape who you are. Um, and now my room is, my office is sort of cluttered again with Degrassi. So I've sort of embraced it again. But you know what? I know there will come a time when I will leave it alone and I will walk away and I will get back to what I normally do. But because of right now, the kind of industry that I'm in, uh, I do pop uh, culture events. I, I represent talent. I um, appear all over North America. Um, I, I do speaking engagements. I, I do screening events. Now that I've got the documentary from the reunion, uh, I'll be doing screening events. That was what I was supposed to be doing this year, was appearing with Stacey Mistician, who played Caitlin, um, at, at venues across the country. But um, little by little, things will get back to normal. Right now, I'm just having a nice time. What, what's been lovely and, and to help pass the time is engaging fans on social media, creating these events uh, online uh, and engaging with them, with, uh, with fans of the show and hearing their stories and hearing how the show helped them out through a difficult time in their youth. Um, that, that's been, I think, a real honor for me because back in the 80s and 90s, there was no social media. There was no way to engage like we're doing right now. Um, we would maybe get the odd fan letter once in a while or a media interview for like the Toronto Star newspaper or something where they would praise the show at, you know, and, and, and that's how we would know that people liked it. But in terms of instant gratification from the fans, we never got any, um, not like on stage when you do a performance and you get an applause. Um, I had no concept of how many people watched the show or enjoyed it or what they took away from it. Now, as I'm meeting them in real life, that's when the conversation happens. That's what Degrassi Palooza, the three day event that I held back in 2019, that's what that was about. It was, you know, uh, we had 300 people that gathered at this event to meet 25 cast and crew and hear the stories and, and share our, our mutual experiences of what Degrassi meant to them. Um, I mean, I, I could go on for forever about this, yeah. but, but what I mean is like, you know, the joy I get from hearing their stories and, and understanding a little bit better why Degrassi meant so much to them and why it still means something uh, special to them today at, at, you know, as they're in their 40s or some are in their 50s. Um, it was an old friend that they could rely on back in the day and learn and um, not feel like what they were going through, uh, that, they, that they were alone, that, that there were other people out there like them that they could um, relate to. And, and I think a lot of people related to the characters of the show. Yeah, so um, we were just um, talking about um, your character, Joey, and I just watched an episode and you broke Caitlin's heart. Was this pulled out or was this an episode of just the regular show? No, this is the first season. How She's could you delicate that Caitlin? She's too sensitive. <laughs> Well, it's funny because you like, I mean, like, cause you mentioned schools out. I hadn't done a deep dive into that until recently and went back. And when you go and you watch schools out and it's like this, the last 20 minutes of this show ends in like complete chaotic <laughs> destruction. And <laughs> like, what happened? One of the writers that we had at Palooza uh, answers that question rather nicely. Um, I'll try to, articulated but basically he said that Degrassi never wrapped anything up in a nice little bow it was never meant to be this cute little sitcom that at the end of each episode everything you know ended beautifully and everybody walked away all happy that um that there was always consequences for choices that were made by the, the characters um at the time that we shot schools out everybody was moving on everybody was getting ready to go to university or do whatever that they were planning on doing and even the writers and the producers of the show were kind of over the whole Degrassi uh, thing. So I think they wanted to go out in a big bang. They were, you know, let's kill somebody, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it, it was just, it was a way that they wanted to end the show that made people go, holy crap, what the hell did I just watch? So I think because of the way the show ended, there was never any resolution. I think a lot of the fans who watched Schools Out went, what the hell happened to Wheels? What the hell happened to Caitlin? What the hell happened to Joey and Snake? And they wanted more. So because we didn't just, continue the show or the series for another two, three, four, five years. And the show just kind of felt, um, died off. Um, we were at our peak and the show was doing really, really well in the ratings and schools out was just this one super awesome finale that people were just like, what the hell did I just watch? And then you had the F bomb and all that other cool stuff. Yeah. But you know, 
early nineties, uh, at the age of 19, 20 years old, um, it wasn't, it was very, very different television that we were doing with schools out. It made, it would look so polished. It looked very Hollywood. And, and, um, I, I really, really enjoyed that movie. Um, and, and we celebrate it often because that's what started the whole Degrassi tour was it was the 25th anniversary of schools out. And that's when Stefan, uh, Brogren, Stacey Mystician and Kirsten Bourne and I, uh, were, were screening the, the movie in theaters across the country and, and people came out in droves to watch. It was awesome to, to relive it again through their eyes as they watched the movie theater. It was a lot of fun. What was it like to be Joey Jeremiah and then live your own life too as, as Pat? Acting and doing Degrassi felt like a, a summer camp or an after school gig. Um, you know, rehearsals and read throughs and, and all that stuff took place after school. Uh, most of the filming took place during the summertime, so the summer months when you were off from school. Um, back-to-back episodes were rare, where a lead actor would have one episode and then the immediate one afterwards. Like we would take episodes off so that we could either catch up on our schoolwork or, or you know, make sure that we didn't fall behind. So if Joey was the lead in one episode, the next episode would probably be a twin storyline or something like that. Um, so it, it never felt like it took over our lives, it was just sort of a part of our lives. And the friends we had on the, sh- on the show were like our friends from school. So, you know, if, if some of you after school would hang out at a friend's house or on the weekends go and do something, that's kind of what we would do. We stayed in touch immediately after the series ended um, for as long as possible, but then everybody kind of went their own ways. And with the whole reunion that's been taking place the last few years, I've welcomed a lot of these people into my home. I've got to meet their, um, their children, their, their spouses, and, and they're all completely different than, you know, there's still parts of us that, you know, are like when we were 20 years old. But obviously, there's been a lifetime since we've last seen each other. And it's really, really nice to reacquaint with, with everyone and see where they're at and, and how they ended up. But um, again, I, I, I'm really sad that everything happened the way it happened in 2021 or 2020 with COVID because I was really excited to continue that reunion, re, that, that reconnecting with, with all of them. And, and, and basically the only way to do that now is online or through emails and social media. But uh, they're there. They're not going anywhere. Uh, we have we nobody. Have <laughs> you know what I mean, like there's time. There, there's time to, to reacquaint with people, which is really, really lovely. And that's what I'm looking forward to the next few years. What's the craziest on-set moment? What's the one where when somebody asks that question, you're like, oh, this is the one. It's always teed up. It's, it's, the, it's the top of the pile. I, I can't think of one, honestly. Not, not a teed up moment because uh, there were so many. Like your perspective of the show is completely different than mine, obviously. You guys remember the, the episodes and the characters and all that stuff. I have thousands and thousands of hours of on-set memories behind the scenes um, things that we did, the mundane stuff of just hanging out for 14 hours a day, you know, six months a year, um, just being silly on set and, and acting like kids. And um, man, oh man, like I'm not going to tell you about all the, the stuff that we did off set and all the crazy Aww. fun. That no, it's not my business. It's, you know, <laughs> I'll save that for part two of my book. But uh, no, like, I mean, for every moment that you had in, in your high school experience, um, you know, multiply it by 10, because for us, it was a very intense um, five years that we spent together. And um, it was a very special time uh, because even though we didn't know exactly how our show was going to reach fans and people around the world that watched it, we knew that we were trying to do something special. We knew that we were trying to create something that was going to communicate and and reach out to people. Um, We just never understood the the grasp of it or, or the the intensity of how people would react to the show. Um, and it's lovely. Like, I and mean, it's a TV show. We, we, we didn't cure cancer or anything like that. But at that, at that time, we were having conversations and talking about things that were pretty much taboo in a lot of parts of either North America or even other countries. Like, for example, for example, we had people come up to us and say, listen, I grew up in a very small town. We didn't talk about this kind of stuff either in school or with our families or rarely you know amongst our friends but because it happened on the show we were able to talk about what was happening to the characters on the show because that's what we were all watching so it allowed for a dialogue to take place because you know 
if you guys grew up in Toronto, then you know we're a melting pot and we have this amazing culture yep. that we can experience. And But in other parts of, of the country or, or North America, some people live very rural, simple lives where it's just, you know, things aren't discussed. So the show allowed there to be a dialogue, which under normal circumstances there wouldn't be. Question about the fans. How? Why do you think the fans have followed you for so many years? Because we're now all reachable on social media and we have the, the Degrassi Tour Facebook page and the website. Uh, and I call fans Narbos and Broomheads lovingly because that's what the crew used to call us. Um, so I call the fans Narbos and Broomheads because I, I think for, for many of them, they were um, looking for something they were missing in their own high school experience or in their own lives. And either the characters fill the void or the show itself helped fill the void. Um, a lot of people will say to me or message me um, on social media, you know, Degrassi was the school I wish I had, had gone to or, or the people on the show were the friends I wish I had growing up. And, and when I see you guys on social media, when I see you guys make your appearances, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a reunion, a high school reunion for me. Um, because you guys meant more to me than the actual people I went to high school with in real life, in my small town or in my wherever I grew up. Um, your characters in, in, uh, touched me personally because uh, I could either relate or I had a friend like a Joey Jeremiah or whatever. And so, again, the fandom is is intense. For many, it's it's like their own their own high school experience. They remember that more fondly than than their actual. A real life high school experience and you know for, for many people they just enjoy the fact that through meeting us online it gets to continue the their interaction with Degrassi they there there is no new production or new content being made for Degrassi but what we offer online is a, is a small little taste of, of um, continuing like people love it when they see Stacy Mystician and I uh, take a photo together because it's like ah Joey and Caitlin are back together so they get to live a little bit through our real lives but you know obviously we're very different from our characters um and that's what Degrassi Palooza was all about was to show people that we're very different from our characters although there are some similarities um you know over the years Pat and Joey are, are have separated immensely they're not the same person <laughs> but um I, I highly recommend if you're a fan of the show um and you haven't seen it yet um go, go to the Degrassi tour dot uh, com website get the link to the um, Palooza documentary called uh, Narbo's Guide to Being a Broomhead. And, and there's, there's content, original content there that fans can watch and enjoy. Um, you can rent it or you can download it. It's whatever you want to do. It's very affordable. And like I said, it's brand new content that, um, you know, of all of us telling and sharing our stories and our experiences. And uh, it's a great insight into what it was like, not only for us on the show, but what it was like to have a reunion after 25 years. It was a lot of fun. And you actually directed that, Pat, didn't you? Well, direct is a very, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very generous <laughs> word to use. Um, we, we had only three cameras um, at the event. I wish I had more. I wish I had wireless mics. And there's a lot of things I wish I could have had, but it's better than nothing. Um, I literally just shot the panels. I shot some moments, um, behind the scenes. Uh, I incorporated some archival footage that we uh, as, as kids shot on set uh, back in the day. So that is incorporated as well into the documentary. Um, but it's just, a, it's just a, a reliving of all the panels and, and um, it's almost kind of like, like this, like a podcast, yeah. but in, in, the, in the settings of a, of a convention. Um, and it was just, like I said, it was wonderful to have 300 people from around the world show up for a multi-day event. Um, and for many of them, it was their high school reunion or pilgrimage to Toronto to come visit the actual filming locations and, and, and meet the cast and the crew and, and get that autograph or that picture or ask that question. Uh, it, it was a, a very touching moment for me because many people showed up, many of the cast, um, like David Armin Parcells, who played Claude, on the, on the original series. He drove in all the way from Detroit with his wife and showed up and none of us recognized him because he looked completely different. And I was like, David? And it was just like, it was a reunion in the moment at the reunion, which was amazing. So um, yeah, I, I can't believe I pulled it off and I can't believe it, I didn't go broke doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you didn't go broke doing it. So 
question. If if things get better, um, as far as the vaccine is concerned, um, do you plan to have another reunion tour in 2020? No. No, and unfortunately, um, Carlene, it's, it's I'm not allowed to do it. <laughs> the people who own the trademark, the people that own the name and own the show now, I have no affiliation with them. It's a, some corporation that owns it all. I'm not actually allowed to use the word Degrassi in anything, and I learned a very valuable lesson yeah. about trademark. They con the lawyers contacted me and said, "What are you doing? Why are you putting on an event?" I said, "I'm just here to celebrate my cast, my crew, one of the co-creators, one of the writers." And and they're like, "Yeah, but you're using the word Degrassi. You're not allowed to do that." So I don't know if I'm going to ever do something to that degree uh, of of a get together like I, I did with with I, I, I hesitantly say the word Degrassi Palooza. I call it Palooza, um, yeah. but to do a reunion without the support of the people who own the copyright was difficult because it would have been lovely to have their support. But I just did this as a quote unquote fan and put on this event to celebrate the show, to celebrate the people who created the show. And that was it. I even said it, it's a one-time event. It will never happen again. Um, unfortunately, we lost one of our co-creators, Kit Hood, only six months after the event. Uh, he unfortunately, or suddenly passed away uh, at his home in Nova Scotia. And so, you know, one of the co-creators is gone, unfortunately, but we have that experience of having him at the event and having him share his stories with us, which was absolutely wonderful to, to be able to see him one last time, but also to um, celebrate him. And, and, and that's was, that was my ultimate goal with this event was to celebrate the unsung heroes from the original cast and crew and give them a moment in the limelight to, to, to feel that love from the fans that I had been feeling for years at, uh, during the tour. I wanted many of my other cast members uh, and, and creative team to, to feel that experience as well. And they did, and they were very grateful for that experience. The one thing that I remember doing research on the show is that, you know how like, um, what's it called? Seinfeld, um, Friends, um, all the other shows, they got royalties and Degrassi um, is one of those that you guys as actors because even when the show is rerunning there's no um you don't make royalties off of it there's right? no residuals at all no residuals not on the junior high and high uh that was a non-union show we didn't have agents and we basically signed our lives away as young performers or our parents signed our lives away um you know at the time we didn't know what we were doing we obviously didn't know what the show would become or, or how it would um, live on for decades afterwards. We were just kids happy to be working on, on a TV show. Um, so back then, how I would describe it was um, it gave me a career. It gave me uh, a life I wouldn't have had uh, if it wasn't for the show. And, and you can't monetize that. You can't put a value on that opportunity that was given to me and other cast members. Um, you know, so the royalties really didn't matter because we got this great career uh, out of being on the show. You know, the next generation was a completely different ball game. Um, but at the end of the day, we're still not, you know, retired or making crazy coin. Once in a while when royalties come in, it's nice. It's, it's a little bonus or whatever. But, um, you know, I, I try to stay busy. I try to stay connected to, to online and, and social media and promote the things I do. Um, if I'm not working as an actor, I'm working as an agent to other actors that do appearances at conventions or I create my, my little screening events and whatnot. And Stacy and I, uh, Stacy who played Caitlin, she and I have been having a blast doing these appearances across the country and um, reconnecting, which has been really, really nice um, after all these years. And uh, I, I continue, I hope that the nostalgic factor of the show continues for a little while longer because I hope COVID hasn't crushed it. We all, at this time, in the lives that we're having right now, I think we're all trying to look fondly backwards in time to a simpler time because we're all trapped in our homes and we can't you know, gather with our friends and our loved ones. So we're binge watching, we're watching old shows and movies that made us feel comfortable in younger days and, and from, from you know, our youth. Uh, I know I'm doing that. Um, so- Yeah, I, I watched I, Dawson's Creek. Oh, right. Man. I started watching that. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. So we're all trying to reconnect to our youth in a simpler time. And, 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 and you know, when life was good and, and, and not so crazy and, you know, we didn't have the internet and all that craziness. So 
Um, I, I hope that Degrassi can be a comfort for many people. I hope what we're doing online can be a comfort for many people and, and people are willing to engage with us and, and tell, share with us our, their stories. Um, and, and I hope we can keep doing that for as long as possible. But eventually I will get over the whole Degrassi thing and, and move on with my life. But uh, for right now, it feels good and it feels right to do it. So I will do it for as long as I can. Now, hold on a second. I'm not sure, Carlene, if you're comfortable bringing this up, but I heard there was a nickname. What, Sweet Chocolate? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unpack this for me, because that's fantastic. But look at her. She is. God, she's adorable. <laughs> Just adorable. I mean, fantastic. <laughs> wow. Thanks, guys. <laughs> You try to have fun with every you know moment you can in your day, right? So every little interaction with people that you have throughout your day, even if it's something small like me calling the office to speak to my agent and Carlene would answer, it's just nice to have a little moment with people. When I was doing my convention appearances, um, you would only have maybe one or two minutes with each person that would come, like they would stand in line, they would come up and they'd shake your hand and get an autograph or a picture and they'd leave. And we learned that, that those moments were called micro moments in, in the convention industry. Um, and, and what I learned was that you only have a brief moment to make a, a, an impression uh, that people are going to walk away with and share that experience with, with their friends. So what I try to do is I try to remember every time I meet a, a new fan at a convention that this is their micro moment and this is something they're going to walk away with. And that's what I tried to explain to all my friends when we did Degrassi Palooza. It was like all these people have gone through a great deal of trouble and, and great expense to come to this event to meet you. Please give them that moment that they're going to walk away with. And they did. All my friends, all when we did Palooza, they all did it. They were all fantastic with their, with their fans. Um, but I try to do that in my everyday life. And that's something that hopefully people watching this, uh, this, this uh, blog, video blog, uh, mm -hmm. can walk away from is that even if it's a short moment that you have with somebody walking down the street or, or you know, at the grocery store or whatever, you know, we all have our lives. We all have our issues. We all have our baggage and the shit that we're going through in our lives and whatnot. If you can give somebody a 30 second micro moment that makes them walk away going, oh my God, that was so nice. Or that was so amazing or unexpected, or that put a smile on my face, then, then that's a good thing. And now imagine if millions of people did that around the world every day and had micro moments like that every day, how much better this world would be um, you know, if we could all just understand and appreciate that everybody has their own thing and that, that it's not about you. <laughs> Everything in life is not about you. So, you know, a moment with, with, <laughs> with you calling in the office going, hey, sweet chocolate, how you doing? Like, it's silly. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> but it's something you remembered, right? It's something that meant something and it was a nice moment for you. And, and, and that's, that's fun, right? So yeah. um, I, I hope to recreate many micro moments in the future with fans and loved ones and people once this whole thing ends with COVID. But yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I'll tell you why I learned this. Kevin Smith um, taught me a valuable lesson because he said to me on stage in front of 5,000 people, he said, Pat, we met many, many years ago, back in 1990 in Vancouver when I was a, a film student and you were doing an appearance with, with a couple of other Degrassi members and I came up to you, I stood in line and I, and I came up to you to get your autograph. And I said, I want to be a filmmaker one day. I'm a writer and I hope to make my own movies. And, and Degrassi, you know, is exactly the style of filmmaking that I want to do in terms of writing for characters and whatnot. And he just looked like a normal guy to me, right? And, and, and even though I don't remember this moment, he remembers this moment. He said to me that I blew him off. And I said, yeah, good luck with that. And he <laughs> literally was like, oh, Okay, but honestly, I said, Kevin, I would never speak to somebody like that. But he said to me, no, no, you were not rude to me, but you were dismissive in the sense that, oh, you're just another guy who wants to be a filmmaker. I'm like, dude, I wouldn't do that to you. So he had this banter back and forth, but he remembers his micro moment differently than obviously I did. And he took away from that experience is like, well, you know what? He doesn't believe in me. Screw him. I'm going to do it anyways. And he obviously pursued his career and did very, very well created clerks and all that fun stuff and i joke with him to this day i'm like dude i could have been in clerks is that what you're saying i could have been ben affleck and he's like nope <laughs> yeah nope. right yeah so you know we've bumped into each other many many times over the years obviously he came and did his experience on degrassi uh, i think his little revenge to me was to split up caitlin and joey 
when he had his uh, uh, Jay and Silent Bob do Degrassi experience. So ultimately, he got his revenge on me by by breaking up Caitlin and Joey. Um, so, but I think it's funny. It's all good. Like it's all we all joke. We laugh about it today. But yeah, he he told me that his micro moment with me pissed him off enough. <laughs> Uh, but they, they do say um, that thing that first impressions are everything. So that the first impression that you give someone, I guess it, it goes a long way. Like even years later, he still remembers that. Like he's not letting go of it, right? So. Exactly. And, and he's already told me, like he has no grudges against me about the whole experience. But I'm like, dude, so now I'm very aware and I'm very conscious of every little moment I'm having with people. You know, I had my micro moment with Michael J. Fox a couple of years ago at Fan Expo where I got introduced to Mr. Fox after uh, a, a long day of meeting fans. Uh, one of the organizers said, would you like to meet him? I'm like, dude, are you freaking kidding me? He's my idol. Like I grew up yeah. wanting to be him as an actor. Um, he is really the ultimate performer for me in, in terms of what I was trying to emulate. And so I, I basically got to meet him, shake his hand, say thank you and tell him that he, you know, motivated or inspired me as a, as a young actor. Um, and I emulated him on Degrassi Junior High. That's why Joey had a skateboard. Uh, a lot of my mannerisms on the show and a lot of things I did character wise were based on in my head going, how would Michael J. Fox play this? <laughs> how would Michael J. Fox play Joey Jeremiah? And that's how I because I, I didn't know how to act. Nobody you know, taught me how to act. I just was on the job learning it as I went. I had the ability to memorize dialogue, which was a gift. And unfortunately, I no longer have that gift. But at the time, I knew how to memorize. I knew how to hit my mark. I knew how to, you know, walk through a scene, but how to actually act and be in the moment were things I had to learn on the job. And, and my, Michael J. Fox was sort of like, you know, the guy I would look up to as this short Canadian actor. I was like, oh, I'm just like him. <laughs> so I tried to be like him. And I was a big fan of Back to the Future. Who wasn't? Uh, who wasn't? Right? Yeah, but did you did you own a DeLorean? No. <laughs> no. Did you? I, I, I literally bought a DeLorean because I freaking <laughs> loved the movie so much. And, and I wanted to be Michael J. Fox. So I literally would sit wow. in the DeLorean and drive around in the DeLorean and be like, I'm fucking Michael J. Fox. So like, that's how much he meant to me as, as not only an, uh, as uh, a mentor, but just, you know, everybody wanted to be in, in Michael, uh, everyone wanted to be Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future, right? I'm, so I'm your fan too, Joe. You're always the cool kid, but even though he's like <laughs> nerdy with these crazy little one-liners. That's Yan Moore. All, that's all Yan Moore, our head writer. He wrote all those silly little one-liners. And, um, you know, whenever Joey would talk in the mirror, like, oh, you're going to be the coolest guy at Degrassi. <laughs> like, all this weird crap. I'm like, where does he pull this stuff out of his ass? Like, honestly, Yan Moore, this one man, created this, this universe, this, this world, with all these dynamic characters. And, yeah, he had other help people help with the writing and the producers were involved as well. And even the actors themselves contributed to the development of their own characters. He still had to write it all. <laughs> he still had to, you know, create these, these amazing storylines and plot lines that sometimes spanned over seasons, not just one or two episodes, but you had the spike storyline all the way from junior high throughout high and whatnot. Um, like he had some amazing vision and was able to, create the, the, the base uh, of, the, of, the, of the story arc and then hand it over to us where we would sort of put our own spin on things and our own performance and our own you know, take on what he wrote. And it somehow all meshed in really, really well with the vision of the director and, and the other people that worked on the show to ultimately make this sort of you know, CBC homegrown, simple kind of you know, show that wasn't polished at all like we looked like normal kids in a high school as opposed to everybody being blonde blue-eyed and beautiful you know we had every race represented on the show um and and the nice thing was is that they weren't just the tokens they were you know characters with with serious storylines like the yik you character or you know the, the diana character that's struggling with her older brother who's trying to keep her from going out after school with her friends like things like that because um, and we, we had that conversation at, at the reunion event, like did Degrassi do enough uh, to represent different cultures and different um, um, backgrounds? Like, yeah, we had black, yeah, white, all that yeah. stuff, but there's a lot of in between uh, as well. And did we do enough uh, to, to highlight those things? And I think we did okay. 
you know, we could have, every show could do better, but I think we did okay for the time that we shot the show in and the budget and, and the, you know, we were a 22 minute show when you take away all the com uh, commercials and whatnot, a 22 to 23 minute show that tackled all these heavy duty topics week after week. Uh, and that's all Yan Moore right there. And, and, and uh, that's why I gave him the Narbo award uh, at the uh, event. <laughs> I had a friend of mine create a locker, a bunch of lockers, and we called it the Narbo award and uh, presented it to him for a lifetime achievement. Uh, and and <laughs> he was just like, I had to keep it a secret because if I told him prior to the event that I was going to do this, he wouldn't have come. That's how shy he is. For the guy who wrote so much and put so many so much dialogue in the mouths of all of our characters. Uh, the guy's a man of few words uh, in real life. So uh, God bless him. And uh, I was just happy to put a spotlight on him uh, at the event. Yeah, wow. it's the creative minds, right? Those are it the really is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We get the glory. We get the glory because we were the faces that people saw every week. But there was so many people that worked behind the scenes that helped make this show really what it was. And, and that, that was, you know, even the people that were in charge of the art department and the clothing, the costumes and whatnot, um, they had a big role to play on the show too, because if you look at the grassy, if you look at, you know, all the banners and all the way the style, the show had a sense of the style uh, and the wardrobes that we wore, that was all them. Like, you know, we didn't pick our wardrobe. We didn't um, dress ourselves. That was them doing all that. Now we gave them shit half the time for it. Like, you know, do you have to shop at Valley Village? Do you have to go to Goodwill? <laughs> Can you not buy some name brand stuff for us? Yeah. This wasn't in the budget. Oh so. no, so we didn't even, see, I didn't even know that, right? The things that like, you know, that you guys are wearing. Wow, tight budget at that time. But that show was ahead of its time. You brought, like you said, there's so many things that were uh, brought up on that show. You know what I mean? You learn about AIDS and having, mm -hmm. you know, having a baby when Spike got pregnant, like all those things you touched on like everything. And we, like you said, um, if you weren't in a household where your parents taught you those things or spoke about it, like you learned about it on Degrassi and, you know, it was, it was an educational show, you know? Yeah. Because at that age, when you're 13, 14, 15 and up, like you may not have all the information. You may not, you may feel with your friends that you know what you're talking about, or if your friends are sharing their own personal experiences, they may not have all the information. So at least when our show discussed a certain topic or issue, we tried to give a well-rounded and balanced idea of what we were talking about so that you had both sides of the story uh, and people could then walk away from that and make their own decision if, if it was right for them to drink or do drugs or whatever. We weren't trying to be preachy. We were just trying to give you all the information you needed. That's why the twins, the twins were a great pair of characters to have in any episode. And that's why they were usually floating around being friends with uh, Lucy or, or, or Spike or, or uh, Stephanie Kay or whatever, because they were the yin and the yang of the storyline. If there was something going on, you'd have one twin saying, oh, that's a great idea. And the other twin would say, are you sure you want to do that? Like they were the, a perfect balance for any storyline so that we could um, discuss both sides of, of any issue that was. Uh... So if you watch the series now with that in mind, you'll see, oh my God, the twins are always you know, the different opinions of, of, this, of, of a certain topic. Pat, you made a brief mention about Kit Hood, and I wanted to ask your thoughts on, because from what I read, like there was a little bit of flack for him getting this thing made, as well as with the topics that, you know, you guys were covering, that was considered to be a little bit, again, cutting edge on the forefront, maybe not palatable by certain people. What was it like working with him? Kit Hood was the captain on set. You know what I mean? Like he ran the ship and he gave the orders. Uh, he was an actor's director because he came back. He came from England with a theater background. Uh, he was a child uh, actor uh, in the theater. And so he understood character development. He understood pulling performances from his actors. And he knew how to articulate that in a way that a, a young actor could not, can understand. Um, one of the things he taught us was to be in the moment and not to act, but to react. So he taught us the skills on set that we needed to, to, to do what we did. Um, sometimes he would try to manipulate us. So for example, if my character needed to be extremely serious in a scene, but I was feeling giddy that day and I couldn't 
do my performance without laughing or I couldn't keep a straight face for whatever reason. Because at the time I was still blown away that I was an actor and I would sometimes stop in the scene and in my head going, holy fuck, all this is happening right now and it's focused on me. And I would giggle. I would think it's funny that like all these cameras are here and all these people are working. And I was like, oh my God, I'm actually an actor on a show. And I would get giddy and I would, you know, not be able to keep a straight face. So Kit would get mad and he would like, you know, berate me and be like, Pat, stop it. And I would like get all serious and be like, oh my God. And then like, so he knew how to have a conversation with a teenager to make us understand, to, to, to make us better performers. But he was firm, but he was a good, good director. And, um, you know, in terms of, he didn't do any of the behind the scenes stuff with the accounting and the producing that was all Linda Schuyler, but Kit was the guy on set that made everything happen on set. So um, to have that energy, to have that positivity, to have that creativity was, was awesome. Like he was really the driving force when it came to being on set and filming and, and, and what he was able to pull out of all of us as actors. Um, unlike, and that, and that was something that I wanted to make sure the world knew and understood was that, you know, he really was the creative and driving force uh, of the entire uh, junior high and high series. And obviously schools out, he was um, the man behind that as well. Yeah. So I do hope that, you know, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to honor him this year in Toronto. We wanted to do something that was not public, but we wanted to be able to invite our cast and our crew and, and the people who, who were around back then to have a moment to, to celebrate him and memorialize him in Toronto with his family. But unfortunately, because of COVID, we, could, we couldn't do that this year. So I do pray that in 2021, we'll be able to have some kind of gathering uh, as, a, as a group, as a family, and, and celebrate him the way he should be here in Toronto. So cheers to 2021, everyone. Mm. Okay. <laughs> well, we are running out of time, Pat. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate mm -hmm. you taking the time to do this. Thanks, Matt, for joining me. And um, I hope that, um, you know, the rest of the year goes well for you. And hopefully 2021 will be the year that things will get better. The last thing I'm going to say to everybody watching at home right now is thank you so much for taking the time to, to, to share with us today and watching this podcast. I hope you walk away with a little something that you didn't know about us before. Um, but yeah, check us out on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on, on, on Twitter. Uh, the website is DegrassiTour.com. And if you get a chance, uh, maybe watch our little documentary, The Narvo's Guide to Being a Broomhead. Thanks, Pat. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.